Tatra Nisanga Pragnaya Bhavet Nishalang Nisharat Chittam Eki Kuryat Prayantataha. The mind should not be allowed to enjoy the bliss that arises out of samadhi. It should be freed from attachment to such happiness through the exercise of discrimination. If the mind, once attaining to the state of steadiness, seeks externality, then it should be unified with the Atman again, with effort. Shankaracharya's Commentary The aspirant should not taste the happiness experienced by yogis seeking after samadhi. He is not to be attached to that happiness. What then should he do? He should become unattached to such happiness by knowledge through discrimination and think that whatever happiness is experienced is false, conjured up by ignorance. Thus, the mind should be turned back from such happiness. Whence, when, once being withdrawn from happiness and fixed on the state of steadiness, if the mind again manifests its outgoing propensities, then control it by adopting the above-mentioned means, and with great care, make it one with Atman. Make the mind attain the condition of pure existence and thought. Namaste. So, last time, we talked about how to practice this yoga. This yoga means being situated in the Atman, the self, with a capital S, huh? the big self, <laughs> and forgetting all about the small self, the empirical self, the individual. But being situated in Brahman in such a way that one is free from both happiness and distress, free from attachment, aversion, projection, all of these mental aberrations. And that is done by approaching Shiva and becoming one with him. Now, this is going back. So far now, we've been talking on the Ajata platform. But how do you reach the Ajata platform? You have to go through the Vivarta platform. Vivarta Vada. The view that the world is simply an illusion. Ajata. None born. So how practically do you do this? Well, back in our series on Ramana Maharshi years ago, we talked about diving into the heart. Ramana talks about this. If you've ever done any free diving or scuba diving, then you have a similar experience where you dive under the water and you push yourself down. It takes an effort because the body naturally wants to float. So you push yourself down and then when you go deep in the heart, down all the way to the bottom, you will find a Shiva Lingam. Now, I'm not joking. You really will find a Shiva Lingam. And by worshiping Shiva in that form, he will let you merge with him. He will let you enter into the Shiva Lingam. And when you enter that Lingam, 
you will find it's filled with light. And there are all kinds of forms in that light, but nothing that can be described by a name. But then you go deeper into the light and it becomes formless. And this is Brahman. Brahman is only aware of itself. It's not aware of anything external and it's pure bliss beyond happiness and unhappiness. To be aware of happiness or unhappiness, you have to consider yourself an individual. I'm happy. See, who is this I? <laughs> this is the individual. And the individual doesn't really exist. So even the happiness of yogic samadhi is actually ignorance. It's actually maya. It doesn't really exist. And the proof of this is that it requires effort. Yogic samadhi requires a continuous effort of concentration. And if that concentration is broken for whatever reason, or the effort ceases, you pop right out of it back into external consciousness of the senses. So it's not real. But the happiness or the bliss of Brahman is not due to any effort. It is simply due to recognition of the fact that we are already Brahman. We don't have to go through any effort or any transformation or any special realization or any mystical whatever we simply have to see that this is really the way it is. So I've given some indication of how you can approach this. And of course, in the Shiva Purana series, we've talked extensively about worship of Shiva and especially the five-syllable mantra, Om Namah Shivaya. That's why we introduce all these videos with some creative <laughs> video synthesis and the different expressions of the mantra. See, this is why this mantra is so powerful because it grants access to the highest level of reality, the platform where Shiva resides. He is Brahman. And he manifests a form only for the sake of uplifting the conditioned souls in the creation, out of compassion. That's why those who really follow him also work out of compassion for the benefit of the conditioned living entities, without trying to make a business of it, without trying to profit from it, uh, just trying to give some help and direction to the lost souls. <laughs> because we have direction. We have purpose. We have meaning. We have found our relationship with the Absolute. That we are the Absolute. And so, Shiva, hum, we are Shiva. Those who are in the realization of the self. Because why? We know that we are Brahman. We know that the world is illusion. Huh? Brahma Satyam Jagan Mitya. It's false. And then we have to act for the benefit of the conditioned souls. That's the third part of that saying that everybody forgets. Knowing that you are Brahman is static. Knowing that the world is illusion is simply a denial. But then going on to act 
in the same way that Shiva does, out of compassion. This is the real thing. And, and this keeps us in our realization of Shiva effortlessly because we get help from higher authorities. See, when we do Shiva's work, Shiva helps us. And we don't have to make any effort to stay in spiritual consciousness. We just have to follow his direction, which he gives by example. He speaks so many scriptures, especially the tantras, that give directions for the relief of the material conditioning. So we also, in our small way, in our, <laughs> you know, not very powerful way, <laughs> but as far as possible, we follow this same direction. We emulate, not imitate, because that's not possible, but we emulate Shiva. And we give, as far as we can, our own reflection of the insights that we learn from him. And hopefully this will benefit a few people, if anybody's listening, <laughs> if anybody's really taking this to heart. But again, if you dive into the heart, you know, just let go of the mind and senses. Forget trying to do stuff in the world. It only leads to sorrow. So give that up. And don't try any tricky yogic samadhi and all this stuff. You know, it's a step on the way. It shows you that you can experience happiness whenever you want. Okay, big deal, right? <laughs> Once happiness becomes like something you can get any time, it becomes cheap. It loses its rarity, and so it loses its special value. If happiness is only something we can experience once in a while, similarly, seemingly by chance, then it becomes something to be coveted and craved. But if simply by taking a deep breath and contemplating the self with the self, we can experience that same happiness, then happiness doesn't become such a big deal anymore. So we can go beyond happiness, beyond samadhi, because this kind of happiness is achieved by rejecting the external world. But in the kind of happiness that we're talking about, in Ashlesha, this yoga doesn't require rejecting the material world. We can embrace the material world knowing that it's illusion and enjoy it, play with it, love it, appreciate it as a work of art by Shiva and Shakti and do our part to make it a better place. If everybody did this, just imagine what a wonderful world it would be. Huh? If everybody lit one candle, you know. <laughs> but it's true, isn't it? The problem is people don't know how because they're attached to their personal benefit. But if you can taste those benefits any time you want, without any real effort, just by your recognition of what is already so, then there's no need to strive for one's benefit because one's benefit is already there. This is the great secret that leads to the highest form of self-realization. And this is what we're sharing with you through this Upanishad. Aum Tatsa. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya. <laughs>